É, bom dia, pessoal. Vamos, então, dar início ao nosso Centro de Estudos de hoje, que a gente vai continuar, mais uma vez, ainda falando sobre Covid, a SARS-CoV-2, que é o que não acabou, tá? inclusive no Brasil, falando de uma quarta onda, que está deixando todo mundo em pânico, né? Enfim, é, nós temos o prazer de receber a doutora Daniela Weixpoff, Weixpoff da Universidade de La, La Rodia, Rodia, Rodia. Um, um, ela vai, vai apresentar a palestra e vai ser mediada pela nossa colega, a, 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 a Fernanda essa, é, Eloísa Cortes, e... Um, o que a gente quer, sugere que as pessoas que, que passam as perguntas, quem for fazer as perguntas, é, se possível, façam em inglês diretamente, tá bom? Porque a palestra vai ser feita em inglês pela doutora Daniela, então fica mais, assim, mais direto, direto se fizerem as perguntas em inglês. Mas se fizerem em português também, a Fernanda está aí para resolver o problema, tá bom? Quem precisar de falar em fazer em português. Então... É, Thank you, Dr. Daniela Weixport, and um, good lecture for you. Uh, Rafaela, por favor, apresente a Fernanda, que a Fernanda vai apresentar a Daniela. Sim, ok, obrigada, bom dia a todos. Então, como a Marli falou, a gente vai receber uma convidada internacional, doutora Daniela, da Universidade de La Jolla, na Califórnia, ah, quem vai fazer a moderação da, da palestra da doutora Daniela é a Fernanda Cortes, que é graduada em Biologia pela Universidade Estadual do Norte Fluminense, tem mestrado e doutorado em Biologia Parasitária pela, pelo Instituto Oswaldo Cruz, ela desenvolve projetos envolvendo indivíduos infectados pelo HIV, capazes de controlar a replicação viral na ausência da terapia antirretroviral em indivíduos HIV positivos na fase aguda de infecção. Em 2020, iniciou o projeto de pesquisa com foco na resposta de células T de indivíduos infectados pelo SARS-CoV-2 e avaliação do perfil de ativação, exaustão e funcional dessas células. Tem experiência na área de imunologia e biologia molecular, com ênfase na resposta imune em HIV e AIDS, SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19, e com foco na resposta de células T, ativação imune celular e inflamação. Atualmente, ela realiza o pós-doutorado no Ladiola Institute for Immunology, e é de lá que vem a nossa convidada, então agradeço a Fernanda pela sugestão da palestra, né? foi a Fernanda que sugeriu. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Daniela, for being here with us, and then I'm going to, to let Fernanda to introduce you you and then you can start your lecture. Thank you uh, and good morning for everyone. Fernanda, por favor. Okay, good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Daniela. It's very early here. So she's already in the lab for this lecture and it's a pleasure to uh, uh, receive her here. And Dr. Daniela uh, Weisskopf, is a research in La Jolla Institute for Immunology in San Diego, California. She received her PhD in Immunology from Innsbruck Medical University in Austria. Uh, she has extensive work with T cell response to virus pathogens, uh, including dengue and Zika, so a disease that you know very well in Brazil. And the, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, her group uh, has made an amazing job in understanding T-cell response to SARS-CoV-2. So uh, I think uh, everybody will, will enjoy her lecture. And uh, thank you again, Daniela, for, for being here. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Yes, okay, I share my screen. Yes, so thank you for the introduction. And um, I think if I understood correctly, like they have told you that Fernanda is working with me right now. So I'm very excited about that. And um, in my life before COVID, I have been studying flaviviruses, RV viruses, uh, and, uh, and finding out like how the T's are response against these viruses that are so um, relevant for Brazil um, are reacting. But the last two years, just like everybody, I have been focusing on uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, vaccines 
against SARS-CoV-2, and how does our adaptive immune response recognize this, um, either a natural infection or most uh, recently we have been focusing on vaccination. And that's what I'm gonna like talk about today. Um, as you heard, um, my name is Nila Weiskopf. I'm here at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. And uh, we have been like in the last two years, almost all of us focusing entirely um, about this. So what are we referring to when we say um, adaptive immune response? So we are interested in always the three different layers. So we are studying the antibodies, um, the B cells that produce the antibodies. And my focus particularly is on the T cell side. So I'm interested in CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And all of these different parameters are important because we know that antibodies for many, many licensed vaccines are the correlate of protection and also like the, the correlate of like, you know, like um, if there's seroconversion, you know that the vaccine is like working. So we have to like look at this and most of the people look at that. But we also interested in looking at the second layer of the immune response and why is that important because you not only have one um, protection from like an infection you have multiple layers so we are interested in like the second layer which is the cellular immune response we know that cd4 t cells are critical to like um, health antibody responses and we know particularly in sars that they are like able to independently without antibodies are protecting um sars mice from sars cov2 infection so without antibodies even t cells can contribute to your protection and then of course cd8 t cell responses are uh, important in many many viral infections they're able to like introduce um, the killing of infected cells and that's one of the important different hallmarks of immunity against SARS-CoV-2 and any other virus really if you have antibodies that are able to like neutralize a virus once you like um, the virus is um, able to infect you but once the virus is inside a cell antibodies cannot recognize it anymore but T cells can so T cells can recognize um, infected cells and are able to help to clear these infected cells. So that's why it's important that we look at this in, in uh, totality and look at all different parameters of the immune response. We have in the beginning has asked the question, how long does immunological memory against SARS-CoV-2 last in people that are naturally infected? That means people that have been exposed to the virus and have cleared the virus. And, uh, and, uh, and what if you study the immune response six months, six to eight months post-infection, how does it look like? And that was very much early, our very first hint that there is actually sustainable immune response um, measured against all of these different parameters. So you can see here, there is antibody responses, and you can see the half-life of these antibody responses, that's what the blue line is indicating, is about 140 days. So that was good news because like very early on, there were, were like reports that like the immune response falls off a cliff and the immune response wanes very quickly. And, you know, we, we will not be able to to um, sustain memory against this. So, but we saw that for all the different parameters we are looking, so for like um, spike IgG antibody, for neutralizing antibodies, and for like spike IgA antibodies, which are important antibodies when you look, uh, think about mucosal infections, as uh, such as SARS-CoV-2 is one. If you then look at the cellular immune response, you can see that antibody, that SARS-CoV-2 specific memory B cells did not even wane, they were in fact, on the contrary, like going up over infection. So you can see there was no half-life we could able to uh, uh, calculate because like antibody specific, B cell specific for SARS-CoV-2 were going up. And if you look at the T cell response, you can see that, that we, similar to the antibodies, we have like a half-life response of the T cell response of a little bit over 125 days. And for TD, CD4 T cells around 100 days. So it doesn't matter what parameter we look at, at six to eight months after infection, a lot of people still had infection um, uh, protection or memory against um, SARS-CoV-2. And that's important because um, of the, because we want to know if like you are able to form immunological memory against an infection. So this is, a, is also a, a graph that that, that illustrates how diverse human immune response is. You can see there's lots of different people that were like not able to mount immune response. So that ten, about 10%, we saw eight, eight months after infection, you could not see if they were still having immune response against any of these parameters. And that's just a matter of like human immunology. Like, so 
we are a very, very diverse population. All of us have different uh, immunological genes. So that just shows and underlines the importance to study like larger amounts of people because like the immune response can be so different. So overall, to summarize this natural infection part, we could see that like, you know, one month after infection, everybody was able to amount like um, a majority of all of these parameters that we have been just talking about, but also six months out, and that was the good news, the majority of people is still able to like form and maintain memory up to six months post uh, uh, infection. And you can see well, why I say it's important to like understand that and study that because like we still don't know to this day if you are part of this white group, so you're part of the 10% that is not able to form memory. So we do not know one month after infection in which group you will be. So that's why it's important to understand that and don't feel like once you have an infection, you will be protected. And same is true after vaccines. And I will show that in the next, uh, uh, next uh, the rest of the talk. Because that was then our next question. Well, okay, so now we understand um, immunologically after infection, but like, how does that change about after vaccination? And early in 2021, vaccines were rolled out and we asked this exact same question and the samples that we have been working with was like um, Moderna mRNA 1273 um, vaccination cohort and that is because like in the United States this was one of the vaccines that was like early rolled out and we have been able to study and I want to point out that what the cohort that we have been studying was like a low dose so a quarter of the dose um, from the dose that's now given, which is 100 microgram of the Moderna vaccine. But we were still interested because we thought like if the, if the vaccine dose is lower, we can see differences based on age group or based on like um, um, different times after vaccination might be even more visible. So this is um, quickly an overview of the core we studying. So all of these people have gotten uh, 25 microgram of the Moderna vaccine. They are divided in different age groups. So we have 18 to 55. 56 or 70 and over 70 because early on there was always a concern well what we are seeing in like this um, studies is that true for like young people or is that true also for older people because early on we realized that this is a more susceptible group so we have been studying this longitudinal sample and that's important because we have been collecting samples from the same people over like four different visits the first sample was collected on day one uh, the second one of, on day 15, which is after the first immunization. And then <coughs> the visit uh, three was uh, 14 days after the second infection, so the second immunization. And then to compare it with what we have seen in natural infection, what happens six months after second immunization. And I quickly comment on why it's important to not study like very close to infection, but also further out is because like only after six months, you will see truly the level of memory that has been formed. Because if you look too early, you are still gonna um, study like in this waning phase. And that's when you collect very different, co calculate very different half-lives. And that's probably why these early reports have come out and said like, we quickly will wait that. But so six months is when you can uh, have a good balanced uh, immune response and you can uh, assess the memory truly the memory that has been contracted after like infection or vaccination phase so what did we find out so early we saw that the uh, almost everybody um, was able to maintain visa responses after the um, after the first shot already everybody was able to mount antibody specific response after the first, after the second shot so that's why um, two of these uh, shots are given for moderna also like for many of the other vaccine regimes and six months out you can still see 100 percent of people um, um, having an antibody response against sars-cov-2 and that was the same it doesn't matter if you look at spike specific Specific IgG, so you're looking at the entire protein, which is the one is in the vaccine constructs, or RBD, which is a smaller part of a spike protein um, that is like known to like have the most um, binding SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So both of these um, um, proteins, antibodies against both of these like sites, were significantly higher at all three time points after vaccination, and they were maintained up to a six months uh, time point.
but as I told you before, I'm interested in uh, um, CD4 and CD8 teaser responses, and that was much less known about that. So we have been looking into that. So similar to what we've seen after like with antibodies, you see a good response after the first dose. Everybody then was able to mount specific CD4 teaser response after the second dose, and good news, 97 percent. So all everybody except this one person was able to like keep the memory response six months out and that's important and that was good news because like that like antibodies doesn't mean that you quickly like lose these response on the contrary the majority of people was able to uh, maintain that for six months so as you know um this is the summary um of what we have been like looking at. And I'm not showing you all that data in detail because like um, this is um, one of our first studies and I have more uh, lo uh, recent data that I can show you. But so similar to like um, CD4 T cells, we also show that 88% um, were able to mount the CD4 T cell response and more than two thirds were able to keep that CD8 T cell responses up to six months after infection. So that's important because like antibody response is, is mounted after vaccination and is able to be kept and these are responses mounted after vaccination and able to be kept. So this is a summary of a study. I told you that we have seen um, different um, um, age groups, and we saw that antibody responses were affected by age, but T cell responses were not affected by a different age group. So it doesn't matter if we look at the younger group or the very old group, responses, uh, cellular responses were not infected. But if we then look into compare that with natural infections, so we, we were collecting samples from uh, people that have been infected six months before and compare the level of immunity, and we saw no difference. Um, between any of these vaccine elicited responses or people that have been naturally infected. But one thing that I want to point out is like I told you in the beginning that this is the low dose. So when you're vaccinated with like a quarter of the dose that is currently given, it looks like natural infection. You have very comparable levels for all of these parameters we measured. But of course, we all know now that the dose that is given is 100 microgram, and we compared it to that just to see like um, if this is same or different. And we saw that we actually have um, higher antibody response and higher CD4 T cell responses when you give the higher dose. No T cell response, no CD8 T cell response difference was observed. So that's important because that shows that. Even if you give a low dose, you can mount antibody response and T cells compared to natural immunity. But there's a reason why um, the higher dose was like chosen to like then be the dose that has been like vaccinated because you introduce stronger antibody responses and stronger C4 T cell responses. So one thing that we have also noticed early on is okay. So we've seen um, natural infection. We also see in, in the vaccination and it's comparable response, but surprisingly to us was also the observation that we also see responses in people that have never seen this virus. And why do we know they have never seen this virus? Because we collected these samples five years before the pandemic started and we have stored them in our liquid nitrogen tanks. So we knew that they have never seen the virus. And we've also confirmed that by serology that they actually in fact have no antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. But nevertheless, we did see in this black bar here, that's the non-exposed um, um, people, that about half of them were able to mount a CD4 T cell responses against um, SARS-CoV-2. So as somebody that is interested in flaviovirus infections, we know that these viruses are closely related, and we know that there is interference and T cell response that, re that recognize dengue, can recognize Zika, and the other way around. So we were interested if something similar is going on here. Is there closely related viruses that are um, um, that are able to mount um, CD4 T cell memory that is able to recognize um, SARS-CoV-2, and we all know that the clo most closely related viruses are common cold viruses. There is four human relevant viruses circulating right now um, um, that are uh, that are com constantly in the population, and we have been looking into. Um, is if, if they might be the source of the possible uh, cross-reaction. And uh, sure enough, we found that if you look at epitopes um, that are specifically derived from SARS-CoV-2, which are the black lines here, and then you make the same um, homologs of like these uh, epitope stretches derived from any of the four common cold viruses, and you can see that there's cases where like um, two of these viruses are recognized, two of the common colds, so that's cross-reactivity um, from SARS-CoV-2, 
and it's even stronger and higher derived from uh, some of the other common cold. And there's also epitome for almost every of these viruses um, cross-recognized E4 T cells. So, so that was um, reassuring because like we, we confirmed that like our cross-reactivity we have been observed was not, um, was, was a, a source of like previous infection with closely related viruses. Um, but we, what we did not know was um, does this have any influence? So does it matter you have this cross-reactive T cells? Does it hurt you if you have this cross-reactive T cells? Or maybe it does not matter at all. So that was a question that we have been asking. And that's why I quickly did this C course because the population that I've been just showing you was actually allow us to ask this question in a controlled setting because you have to imagine that you have to know the immune response before um, vaccination or infection um, so then you can ask the question if you have this cross-reactive teaser responses if it matters or or makes a difference and so we have split the group that i've been just showing you into people that have had cross-reactive immune response so this blue group is people that had cd4 t cells cross-reactive against common cold and the white one that have not. And as I told you, we in, in Southern California saw this population, about 50% of the people have this pre-existing immunity, 50% did not have. And this is exactly um, how this vaccine group fell. So about half of them had pre-existing immunity and half of them have not. And that's remarkable because like this group, um, uh, the, this um, vaccine um, group was recruited on the East Coast and a very different um, population. So this was not only a Southern California phenomenon, but that was true us in other courts and by the time we have been publishing this groups from all around the world have have seen the exact same phenomenon so it's really not something that is very typical and only for us for our cohort here but like that has been a phenomenon that was global but our cohort here was the one that we could actually then ask the question so now we split this into like pre-existing immunity and not pre-existing immunity and see if the vaccine response is influenced and we could see early on that the kinetics so this is again our spike high to G um, titers that uh, we have been just discussing, but now split into like the blue group, which is the pre existing, and the white group. And you can see the kinetics is faster. So you see more antibody responses and on a faster time point induced in people that had pre existing immunity. And that was true if you look at a spike specific IgG, RBD specific IgG. So again, um, this was for the antibody levels, was not different on the long time memory time point, which makes sense because that's just a matter of magnitude. But when you look at the um, this here side. When you ask the functional question, so so which is the neutralizing titer? Why people measuring the, the neutralizing titer is that you not only get a level of like um, the magnitude of any response, but the functionality. And you can see six months out, people that had uh, before vaccination and previous immunity were able to like have significantly strong neutralizing titers. The similar thing that we observed was true for CD4 T cells. So again, this is splitting our groups in the people that had pre-existing immunity. And you can see this was true for CD4 T cell responses. Half of them had it, half of them didn't have it. So through all time points measured, early kinetics, two weeks after the first dose, second dose, and six months out, people that had pre-existing immunity were able to have a stronger CD4 T cell responses. And that was true for not only for the magnitude, as mentioned here by the AMA essay, but also um, we saw a faster kinetic of functional T cell responses measured by the cytokines. So as I told you, like by the time, this was the first time that we were able to um, look at this in the cohort where we had samples before the vaccination or infection. But by now there's multiple different reports, not only of the existence of pre existing immunity, but now also about the consequence of pre existing immunity. And we saw early on that uh, um, what we've seen in the vaccine cohort has been seen in other people. So the, the functional outcome of pre existing immunity has been seen in natural infection now and also vaccination in different cohorts. So that uh, that's important. So, but what I'm really interested in, and this is our most recent study that has just been published is, so now we have convinced ourselves that after natural infection, we have, um, common, we have um, a stable immune response six months out. And, I, and I've told you like why it's important to look at the six months time point because that gives you a true indication of like how the memory that is formed is present. I have shown you that vaccine, uh, early vaccine studies show that you're able to like um, look into um, 
um, mammary responses. But what we did not know is, because by the time now, um, there's different vaccine platforms that have been rolled out, different vaccines have been given to people, and they all have been associated with different vaccine efficacy. So this is uh, uh, based on the United States, because like this is where we have access to samples. So three different vaccines have been rolled out here in the United States. One we have been just talking to about is the mRNA 1273 developed by Moderna. And we saw that um, the efficacy that was reported early on was um, higher than 90%. A similar vaccine also on based on the mRNA technology was the Pfizer vaccine, also given about two doses and similarly high efficacy rolled out um, um, after like um, early vaccination. Another vaccine that has been given like here in the United States was like adenovirus vaccine, which is uh, developed by Johnson. And this was given by one dose and had also like a high efficacy that was reported early on, lower than the uh, mRNA vaccines, but like still um, was able to protect most people, many people that have been given this vaccine. And importantly, why this was a vaccine of choice early on was because it only required one dose. And that was important to vaccinate a lot of people fast. So of course, the majority of people in the United States here, as you can see on the right side, have been given the Moderna or the Pfizer. You can see here, this is constantly going up. And some of them, um, as I said, the G and G. But why I was interested in this particular like setup was because this is the first time in history that we can study different vaccine platforms that have been given at the same time in the same population and see if there is any differences and if if we any of the immune responses to be observed with any of these different platforms can give any indication why different vaccine efficacy might have been reported. So this is exactly what uh, our main questions were for this study. First of all, is there a different immune response induced by these different platforms? And what is the, what is the difference? And it's able to compare side by side and comprehensively the memory response that is induced by these different platforms. And it's important because typically vaccines are not developed in parallel. Usually like one vaccine is developed, then um, it's assessed, the efficacy is assessed. And I'm thinking about dengue virus, you all know, there's one vaccine that has been developed. Then once we have convinced ourselves that this is working or not, then another vaccine is, uh, is developed and another vaccine is developed. And then maybe second generation vaccines are developed. But this is the first time that side by side, vaccines have been rolled out with different uh, platforms in the same population. And this is a unique um, opportunity to study exactly and ask that question. So this is exactly what we have been doing. So we have been um, recruited people that have received two shots of the Moderna vaccine, two shots of the Pfizer vaccine, one dose of the um, j and which is the adenovirus vaccine. And we have also been able to like um, get our hands on samples that have received a protein-based uh, vaccine, which which is the Novavax vaccine, um, where we have not been able to get early time points, but we have been able to like um, collect samples from like time later time points that have been receiving these samples. And again, the importance of being doing this comparative vaccine studies is like that you reduce your variables as much as possible. So all of these people have been vaccinated in Southern California. All of these people have been like uh, drawn blood right here to La Jolla Institute. All of these people have been, um, uh, the blood has been processed the same way. The sample have been like stored the same way. The sample have been run on the same machine by the same people. So truly like this is like, you know, know where you have like the least variables in your population and can do ask these questions on the side by side. And I told you, we have been collecting five different time points. So the baseline sample, which is before anybody of these people got their vaccine, um, day two, uh, time point two, which is 15 days, just similar to what we have been just discussing. Um, after first shot, 42 days, which is like two weeks after the second shot, um, time point four was three and a half months, just to see when the immune response is contracting. And then of course, uh, the longitudinal time point, six months out was our T5 uh, time point. And as we've just been discussing, we were interested in studying all of these different parameters because all of these parameters have different function. And to truly um, correlate and understand um, possibly association with like efficacy, you need to understand all these different parameters.
so what did we um, what did we compare? This is just a characteristic of our COVID-19 vaccines. And it was important to like um, recruit a homologist uh, between these different groups as possible because you don't want to study like um, Moderna vaccine means that have received that are like in an older age group or in or then compare it to like adenovirus vaccines that only have been given in young groups. So this is just to show you that um, our like um, um, cohorts that we have been recruiting for these different vaccines are very comparable. So majority of people um, have uh, were females, 60%, 40% male. They were on average around early 40s. And you can see also like um, ethnicity, which is uh, 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 um, interesting here in the, in the United States and also the different time points. And as I pointed out, like for Novavax was the only vaccine we didn't have early time points, but we had the, the time point four and five. So the other thing I wanted to point out, we have not have um, subsequential samples for all of these. And this is just to illustrate that for some of the donors, we had baseline responses. For some of them, we had later time points. And for some of them, we had every single time point um, to compare it. So, but in comparison, like when you like then align all of this up, that should give us a comprehensive like in, uh, overview of the immune response that has been um, um, studied. So what did we find out? This is uh, now again, we're starting with the RBD, IgG antibody titers. And so always in red, you can see the Moderna vaccinees, so mRNA 1273, compared to the Pfizer vaccinees, the BNT162V2, compared to the adenovirus vector vaccine, the Malpachans, and the Novavax vaccine. And you can see um, always the, the, the thicker line is like the geomean that has been like compared against all of these different donors. And you can see here in the black, in the gray background, the individual response. And just what we have been seeing uh, already by natural infection, also here, um, there's a heterogeneity depending on the individual uh, donors. But if you do the geomean against all of these different sample studies, you can see uh, the kinetics um, of the cohort that we have been um, um, comparing. And you can see here um, if there is a significantly different and if what to what vaccine. So again, um, red the Moderna, blue the Pfizer, uh, green the g and and then purple the Novavax. And you can see here um, the antibody titers for both of the mRNA vaccines was significantly higher than the um, adenovirus vaccine vector, but uh, not different compared at the later time points um, compared to the Novavax vaccine. So this is just illustrating like how we were able to then compare side by side and ask these questions. The same was true then for the functional antibody readout, which is neutralizing titers. You can see um, the kinetics follows like what we have been seeing in a low dose response. So high kinetics after the second dose. And again, this was stronger, um, significantly stronger in the mRNA vaccines than compared to like the adenovirus vaccines. And um, we also saw at a later time post Novavax vaccination, I was able to like mount significant um, neutralizing titers. So one thing I want to point out, so while we do see, I don't know why this is moving. Okay, what we do see um, is the kinetics is, is very different between like platform that are given by mRNA vaccination and platform that are given by adenovirus vaccination because you can see um, just what we have been looking at before first dose um, induces immune response, second dose increases it even higher and then you see a decline up to the memory time point. So this was true for the Moderna vaccines, but you can see here in the green line, this was different for the adenovirus vaccine where it kept going up, 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 right? No matter what time point we were looking at, we saw higher neutralizing titers. And that was interesting because that's a different kinetic what we see for the mRNA vaccines. So the magnitude was lower, but like the kinetics was very different between these two vaccines. Um, how does this compare to natural infection? Because that's also always what like we are interested in. Like, does actually vaccination increase your immune response, your immune memory when we compare to natural infection? And so this is now again so the vaccinees. You already know the colors: red for Moderna, Pfizer, and um, J and J and Novavax, and now compared to the yellow ones here, natural infection that have been recruited at the same time point uh, when we compared the vaccination. You can see here, um, both um, of the um, mRNA vaccines induced higher and stronger antibody responses uh, when then compared to natural infection. And that was true again for like um, antibody magnitude, but also functional magnitude. So how uh, is this for T cell responses? 
um, uh, cellular responses. So we were interested in um, looking at the B cells. And I remember the very first slide I showed you was like that the B cell response that is specific for these um, spike specific um, um, B cells was actually going up after natural infection at any time point we have been looking. And we see the similar phenomenon here after vaccination. You can see here um, when we compare the 3.5 time point with the six months time point, it doesn't matter for which vaccine we see it going up um, um, just like what we saw for natural infection and that's important because like you you kind of want to know if your vaccine induces a completely different immune response than natural infection or if it's si similar following like a similar kinetic a similar like rules so to say than natural infection because you you kind of want to know um if you if you compare something comparable and that's one thing that um what I, which i have always been doing also in my other studies you need to understand what natural infection immune response is when you compare it to because otherwise you do never know what if a vaccine induced response is like better worse or like it does or uh, is completely different um, at all. So that's another thing. It's important to understand natural infection so then you can compare the vaccine. And here for the B cells, just like what we saw for natural infection, you see the, the B cell specific for uh, these um, RBD spike, and I'm not showing this here, but also for all the other B cell parameters, it's going up. And there's actually no difference in the magnitude, um, significant difference when you compare these B cells compared to natural infection. Um, I'm not showing this here, but we're also looking at the different isotypes, and uh, we saw that IgG isotype was the most prominent population for any of these SARS-CoV-2 specific member B cells. But as you know, what I'm mostly interested in is like the cellular immune response for the T cells, and this is shown here now. Again, we have the four different vaccines following the different kinetics and the different time points, and you see that um, Moderna is is inducing a, a significantly strong immune response already after the first shot, second shot, and then able to maintain it all the way out to the six months time point. And the same thing is true um, for Pfizer, where you see like, you know, immune response after the first shot, second shot, and then able to maintain it after the six months time point. Interestingly, similar to what we've seen already for antibodies, you see um, a lower response um, induced by the j and vaccine, but pretty much able to maintain it over all the time points that we have been studying. And we see also the Novavax uh, vaccine protein, the protein vaccine is able to induce um, significantly immune response uh, uh, as, as was a question because like protein vaccines, sometimes you don't know if they are like able to induce a cellular immune response. But in this case, they were able to like make um, significantly strong cd 4 t responses and actually stronger than natural infection if you compare it here, the purple with the yellow, but also like the Moderna is able to induce stronger cd 4 t response than compared to vaccine to a natural infection. What about um, the functional immune response? And that's a point I want to make is it's not in my mind enough to like uh, study only the magnitude of T cells or the frequency, but you also want to know if T cells are actually functional that you're inducing, or is it just like, you know, a level of uh, um, specific T cells that is induced. And this is different compared to um, um, different vaccines. And this is exactly that. So here we see again, um, the mean response of antibodies of uh, cytokines that have been induced by the different vaccine platforms. And you can see again, higher and stronger, more multifunctional um, anti cytokine producing cells produced by the mRNA vaccines, much lower for the um, adenovirus vector vaccine. And there's some um, immune response vaccine, cytokine specific response induced by the Novavax. And Many times when you study like vaccine induced responses, you not only want to know if they are able to induce um, cytokine, multifunctional response, but also how many different ones. Because multifunctionality, that means the ability of like one cell to be um, to producing more than one cytokine is, is associated in other vaccine system with like protection. So we have been asking exactly that question. And here we saw a very similar profile for like the mRNA vaccines, but you can see already here that the adenovirus vaccines not only was introducing lower vaccine response, but also less, um, less um, multifunctional when you compare it with these other um, vaccine responses. So what about um, the final um, um, 
um, interesting part that we are interested in is like the T follicular helper cells. And this is important to understand because like if you don't have T follicular helper cells, you're not able to introduce um, um, specific antibodies or, or highly functional antibodies. You are able to introduce antibodies, but not like the highly functional ones. So this is another um, thing we measured. And you can see here again, following similar dynamics for the mRNA vaccines, um, where like the second dose is boosting the immune response. Um, again, we see like a lower immune response, um, but like maintained over the six months time point. And we do see some of the uh, TF follicular helper cells induced by the Novavax. And one point, which is nothing better than this graph, illustrating again, like the heterogeneity you see in human populations. You can see there's people that respond very strongly. There's people that uh, res don't respond at all. And that is really um, depending on, on the person that got the vaccine. And as I said before, as long as we don't understand in which group that different people will fall, we don't have predictors where we know like, oh, you have this immune response before or after the first shot, um, then you, we, you, we will be able to predict how you're going to look like six months out. There's no way that we can say like this group should be vaccinated or this group should not be vaccinated because we don't have any um, way to tell. So if you compare that now, as we always do to natural infection, you can see there's no difference, significantly difference again for T follicular helper cells in use by the, any of these vaccine platforms or by natural infection. And the final point that we are interested in is like CD8 T cell responses. And that was uh, surprising because like this is the first time that we see no difference. It doesn't matter what the vaccine, res vaccine platform has been used. We see um, um, CD8 T cell responses used by all different vaccine platforms. Um, we did see significantly lower for the protein vaccine, but like in terms of the uh, mostly given vaccines, there is like a level of like um, um, CD8 specific T-cell responses induced by um, the Pfizer, Moderna, and the adenovirus vector vaccine. That is in the magnitude and the, the multifunctionality, not very different from what we see uh, from any of the other groups. So the only difference here is uh, Novavax was, was inducing lower CD8 T-cell responses and also less multifunctional CD8 responses. So this is basically showing um, um, the conclusions of this entire study. So all of the vaccine platforms were able to induce um, immune responses, adaptive immune responses, um, particularly um, uniformly like for CD4 teaser responses that were able to induce that in significant magnitude and quality. Um, we see higher CD4 teaser response and also antibody responses than the viral vector. But then interestingly for the, for the CD8 response, we didn't see any difference with the exception of the NOVA vaccine use responses. So the other thing that I pointed out a couple times during the presentation is like we see different peaks of spike specific teaser responses so there's definitely different kinetics induced by the different vaccine platforms so as we said we were talking about like you know first dose and second dose and then it wanes a little bit versus like for the other virus um, it's kind of like maintained and is similar the same and I just showed you um, that the, the follicular helper cells are used by all um, COVID-19 responses comparable to natural infection and comparable to each other so the other advantage is now that you have all these parameters, you can actually also like define what is correlated with each other. And that is important because like imagine, we can early on find out that like um, antibody responses is correlating with any of the teaser responses that would be much easier to measure on a high um, throughput scale. And we asked exactly that question when we compared all the different parameters and used by the mRNA vaccines or by the JNJ vaccine. And this is again, um, the, the time, the antibody the parameters measured at the time point three, which is 3.5 months, compared to six months to see if we can already tell at three months who will have a stronger immune response and who will not. And this is like basically the interesting thing that we see. So when you look at all these uh, parameters and see what's correlating, you saw early on that <coughs> If you compare responses, CD4, TISA responses, and the TFH responses, and then see if that correlates with antibody six months out, you see a strong correlation. So that's important because that's just another confirmation that TFH cell response actually give you a hint about um, antibody responses that are later that develop. The interesting thing was, though, we didn't see this responses for the JNJ vaccine at all. So this is something to keep in mind that it's very important to like measure all these parameters in the same donors and then learn 
what we can, what correlates with each other, because it's it's not so simple that it works like high antibodies mean high T cells and everything correlates with each other. So so that's really like one point. And and also like why it's important to study the different vaccine platforms because like the rules for one are not the rules for the other one. As as this is illustrating, antibody responses correlate with um, CD40 response in the mRNA vaccines, but not in the viral vector vaccine. So this is basically. Um, just summarizing that what we have been just showing and overall this is basically all the slides I've been showing you now summarized so if you compare it side by side these different vaccine platforms to compare it to like mild infection um, so natural infection with SARS-CoV-2 you see strong um, strong parameters induced by a Moderna vaccine strong response immune by the Pfizer vaccine you see a different kinetics slowly like with like the adenovirus vaccine so where like the AT responses were actually like a stronger one but you didn't see a lot of multifunctional response and again um, CD40's responses and antibodies were strongly induced by the Novavax vaccine but not so much for the CD8 T cell responses. And again, most of these parameters at any time was measured are doing better than when you compare to natural infection. So I have just a couple of slides to end my presentation because I have been showing you now um, what happens if the different vaccine platforms are given and, uh, and what happens after natural infection. But what happens if you mix and match this now? What if you got first one vaccine and then you follow it up with a different vaccine? Is there any difference or is it the same and does it improve uh, the immune response or like does it like you know um, hurt the immune response if you mix and match the vaccines and for that you have heard an introduction that i have been uh, received my degree from the medley university of innsbruck and this is the people that i have been collaborating with because uh, unlike the united states um, what was being given in the in austria was um, astrazeneca vaccine which is a similar vaccine platform than a J, &J. and then there has been a cohort where like they have been following up with like the Pfizer vaccine and uh, this is like uh, my homestead of Tyrol and you can see here what is shown here the county of uh, Schwarz was a, was a county where a lot of people have gotten the AstraZeneca vaccine as the first uh, shot but then have been given the Pfizer vaccine as a second shot because this was one of the first counties where the South African variant was occurring where very early it was clear that uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine doesn't induce high enough antibody titers so that's why we had access to this um, cohort because this was one of the most unique in the world where like one vaccine was given as a first shot and a different one as a second shot and this is basically just giving you like an overview of the different cohorts so we have been comparing uh, people that have gotten Pfizer for two shots we have been comparing people that got the AstraZeneca for two shots and then what we were most interested in like the mix and match cohort that got AstraZeneca first and then uh, Pfizer as the second and this is called the HEVAC study if you wonder what this is standing for this is standing for heterologous vaccination with the Chaddox with the staff. So we're like one vaccine was given a Corminati, which is like a one brand name of uh, the Pfizer vaccine. So what did we find? So again, here is a different group. So AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca in blue, AstraZeneca followed by Pfizer in purple, and then the control group Pfizer, Pfizer. And you see that the uh, just the second shot of Pfizer like like lifts the antibody response to the exact same level as you have would have given like um, both Pfizer shots of the first shot and significantly higher than people that have gotten two shots of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, if you ask the same question for T cell responses, you see the exact same phenomena. You immediately see like people that have been given like Pfizer as the second shot compared to like people that have gotten SD4T's response have a significantly stronger um, CD4T's responses um, when compared to these two groups and it's, uh, it's, it's slightly higher a trend than if you have been given like two shots of Pfizer but it's not significantly so you see a stronger response um, in the heterologous vaccination compared to the homologous vaccination if, if the homologous vaccination is AstraZeneca. This same was not true for CD8's responses and we have already seen multiple times now that CD8's responses don't seem to be different so much depending on the vaccine construct of being given here different on the vaccine schedule also doesn't seem to be like having a this big of a, a, a 
and impact. So the last question we were answering, okay, so there's no difference in magnitude for CD8 responses. We saw a difference in magnitude for CD40 responses, but like what about the functional response? And that was something that was very interesting to see because like if you look at the heterologous vaccination, so AstraZeneca followed by Pfizer, CD4 and CD8, you see like a higher multifunctional specific CD4 and also CD8 responses induced. And that's particularly interesting because like the magnitude, the, the frequency of CD8 cells wouldn't give you this like impression. But then when you look at the functional, you see that there's differences between the cords. So that is interesting because like you can see clearly here um, that the heterologous vaccination was able to induce more multifunctional T cell responses. So that's just um, one of the um, last slides I'm going to show you because it's interesting and we know that in the real world this is happening a lot that people now having like the access to multiple different vaccines and there might be more and more people that have like this mix and match uh, situation. So we saw that heterologous vaccination, so if you have a first and a second uh, shot, the different vaccine induces higher spike specific antibodies, induces stronger magnitude and also like the quality of CD4 T cells, um, it, it promotes higher spike specific CD4 T cells with more multifunctions and I have been showing you that while the, um, uh, the magnitude of CD8 T cells was not um, uh, affected by the different vaccine regime, higher multifunctional um, uh, CD8 T cells were um, induced by the CD8 T by, by the different heterologous and homologous vaccine regime. So that's just something that to bear in mind because we know by now that multiple people will now receive not the same response. By now um, the pandemic has been uh, it's been moving on so we will not have like you know people that have only received one vaccine we will have not people that have like never been infected but have only received the vaccine so we have all different scenarios of like um, hybrid infection like people that have received the vaccine and been naturally infected we will see people that have different vaccine constructs we will see answer the question okay so does this look any different 12 months out after vaccination and, and how are all of this will turn out. So, but like, this is just to illustrate why it is so important to look at all these different parameters because we do think that we have these immune responses, these multiple different immune responses for a reason. And as I showed you in the introduction, I mentioned introduction, yes, to protect against a detectable infection, like antibodies certainly will play a major role because this is like what neutralizes the virus upon entry. Um, and the T cell will have a minor effect on that. But once you are infected, you need all of these parameters to protect you against hospitalization and deaths. And that's an important thing um, to memorize when you think about vaccines. People think about a vaccine should like, uh, um, you know, prevent detectable infection or how we call it producing like sterile immunity. But really that was never the intention of a vaccine. A vaccine was for COVID was always intended to protect you against like severe disease and deaths. And I think if you look at this parameters and that's why it's so important to look at all of this, um, we have been able, not we, people have been able to um, manufacture quickly like immune responses and vaccines that are able to do just that. And with that, I like to thank um, the entire team. So it takes a lot of people to like run studies like this. You all know Fernanda that I was introducing um, me before. She has been involved in this comparative vaccine study. Uh, many of the other data has been like introduced by um, Jose Mateos that has been uh, in my lab since uh, before the pandemic uh, and uh, staying on. And then we have also Rosa um, Galvez who has been involved with like the comparative vaccine study for the teaser responses. But of course I measured much more than teaser responses so there's a lot of other people that have been providing antibody data, um, B cell data, and uh, also have been helping and orchestrating all of this. So with that, I just want to like show that not only the immune system has a lot of uh, uh, different um, cells and we all need them. It's also like a lab has a lot of different people and we all need them to put one of these studies together. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for your intention. And uh, if you have any questions in English or in uh, Portuguese, uh, Fernanda will help uh, you to... Uh, <laughs> To ask that. <laughs> thank, okay. you. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you a lot, Daniela. It was an amazing presentation. I think uh, the work uh, that the La Jolla have developed in, in T cell against COVID is uh, very important and uh, help, me, help me to understand the uh, 
a lot of the aspect of GSA responses. And we uh, have a, uh, we don't have a, uh, yes, I think now you have some questions, but I, I received a question from Dr. Gonzalo from uh, the Lab of AIDS, AIDS. And the, uh, he asked, the, what do you think about the potential advantage of intranasal vaccines platforms for induction of mucosal immunity? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point. Because right now, um, you know, we, we know that uh, people have to receive boosters to like boost their immune response. And that might be one reason because the immune response that these vaccines are inducing is, is different from if you have intra, uh, intramucosal like vaccines. Because but the difference to what I have been previously studying is like that this is a virus that is like in recosal in your life. So you might have need different vaccine approaches. So yes, I know people are working on that and I cannot wait until this comes out and like compare that because like I do think we need um, a second generation vaccines also for this to like really like, you know, uh, break the cycle of like transmission here. Yeah. So that's a very good point. I don't have the answers yet, but uh, I, I'm very interested to see how that turns out. Yes. Okay, we have another question uh, from Dr. Cristina Couto Garcia. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the understanding, work, and presentation, Daniela. Do you have any study going on with your cohort to evaluate T cell exhaustion and after multiple do multiple doses of COVID nineteen vaccine? Yes. So this is literally the question right now um, because. I don't know about Brazil, but in the United States, like they're giving the second booster right now. So the question is, are we boosting every couple of months? And does this like always increase the immune response for the TSA response? Or is there a certain point where we reach a plateau and we don't need another booster for TSA responses? So this is this is a question that is I'm asking right now. I don't have any data yet, but like this is literally like exactly the question that I'm interested in right now because of the point, will we need like boosters every other couple of months? And also, will this have an effect on the TSA response, right? So if you see, um, multiple exposures, like does this have an effect? That's this one. So yeah, very good, <laughs> a very good question. You reading my proposals. <laughs> Okay, uh, so from Adriana Bonomo, uh, thank you uh, for your time and to bring you all this info for us. You'd, I would like to hear from you about the evaluation of peripheral, peripheral TFH, TFH TFH follicular cells help, since these cells should be useful inside the lymph nodes. Yes, that's a very, very good question. And, uh, and, um, and of course, we're using peripheral blood because it's the easiest access. But Shane Crowdy here at the Institute has been like a couple of years ago compared to like lymphoid T follicular helper cells with uh, uh, circulating T follicular helper cells and found which markers. And by, he was doing that by like taking tonsils from, from children, which are lymphoid tissues, uh, compared to like what has been circulating in the periphery and found these markers CX05 and PD1, CD40 ligand that are able to like closely like define circulating ones of course what we see in the blood does never like completely give you the picture what happens in a lymph node or what happens in like a t uh, uh, other lymphoid tissue such as a tonsil but it's our best guess and it's our an, uh, it's an educated guess so we have data why this is correlating but of course particularly for like a, a, a virus like this that is mucosal that could have a different um a very different parameter so one thing i want to mention is we always showed you that like we don't see cd 80 responses or they're very variable in the in the periphery we don't know is if that because they go in the tissue and we can't detect them in the cd 80 in the in the periphery anymore so yeah that's certainly one point that uh, that is a very um legitimate question so so yes yeah. so we we do think that we have um good data why we're using these markers and we're using peripheral blood because it's easy accessible than a lymph tissue but yeah it, it's not going to tell you the entire story so i know there's people that are interested in doing lymph node aspirations and, and, and they will be able to compare things like that yeah for SARS-CoV-2 okay adriana has a second question uh you showed a correlation which was really good for mna vaccine but not good at all with a adenovirus 26, 25, 26 vector. As a second question, what do you think about the multifunctionality and disease protection? 
Yes. So why are we saying that higher multifunctionality is associated with better protection? That doesn't come from these studies. That comes from like studies of influenza vaccine. We know that uh, um, for other vaccines, these are typically associated with the higher multifunctional T cells associated with protection. If that's the same is true here, um, we don't know yet. And the other thing what I want to point out is like, we don't know what level you need to have, neither for antibodies nor for any of the T cells that are able to pro provide protection. We don't know how high the immunity wall needs to be. So that's another question that, that maybe as, as time will like pass on, we will be able to study better, you know, once you lose protection. But yeah, that's a good point. We, 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 we don't know for this specific vaccine vaccination or for this specific virus, if, if the same is true, multifunctional cells like, you know, are correlating with protection. And also like maybe that whatever the level of um, um, cd 8 response might be just enough. So that, so I think future studies will tell us. So that's, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of very good questions. So you already <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now you have some more questions uh, uh, from Chris Marcus. Uh, thanks a lot. We are able to identify individuals who had a, where where you were able to identify uh, uh, individuals who had been infected with SARS-CoV-2 between T2, T3, T4, and T5. Are there difference in the antibody cellular response in this subgroup? Yeah, that's uh, that's another project that is running right now in the lab, not by my group, but Alex Center's group. So, so you have breakthrough infection. That's what we call it when you like infected after vaccination, and we have collected these at different time points. So, you have breakthrough infection after the first, uh, after the second dose, after the third dose. So, that that we don't know yet if that makes a difference. What we also don't know is because like. During all these times, different variants have been circulating, right? So, like, if you have been vaccinated um, on a U.S. schedule, you pr and you have a breakthrough infection after the second shot, you probably have an infection with Delta. Versus now, after the booster, you probably have an infection with Omicron. So, does this make any difference? We don't know. So, there's yes, a lot of open questions. We we have been collecting some of the samples here. Um, me, my group is not running these, but like, there is somebody that's looking at exactly that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Adriana Valoc, uh, great presentation of this outstanding work. Is there a reason different than timing to analyze by Amy instead than proliferation cells? Oh, okay. So the reason we're using the AIM assay, and that dates back to like March 2020 when we started studying this. The AIM assay is the most, for T cells, the most agnostic um, assay when you don't know what antibody, what um, targets they recognize, you don't know what vaccine, what the cytokines they make, you don't know what what is the particular T cell subset that is responding. So the AIM assay with the markers we use allows you to like include T regulatory cells, T follicular health cells, cytotoxic, TH1, TH2. So all of this is in there when you don't know yet what you're looking for, because in the beginning we did not know what what this virus is inducing, right? The, I, if you remember, that was like always a concern that this virus is inducing TH2 response. This was based on Mars Mars one. So, sorry, so one um, infection. So that's why I like to use the A message because it's the most agnostic. Because you have like all the T cell subsets that are specifically in use, but you but but it includes all the ones that are typically not making cytokines, or in your case, you ask for proliferation or able to like you know like maybe proliferate. So that that's the only reason why. Um, this is like usually my essay of choice, but as I said, and that's why we have been always following up with like cytokine responses because like it gives you an, a, a level of magnitude, frequency of these specific cells, but nothing else. So we don't know how they can proliferate. We don't know how to, what the cytokines they're making. So so I think as a first essay, this is a great essay, but then of course it will need to be followed up by other essays. So uh, including like the possible the proliferation essay you're mentioning. Okay, we have more two questions uh, from Henderson Santos. What do you think about the use of annual vaccination for SARS-CoV-2? You'd be the most effective way along with social distancing measures and the use of masks. Yes, so that's exactly the question that like one of the um, um, 
people before asked, so how many, how many, is it going to become like influenza, like an annual vaccine? And that could, could have a, a influenced by like the different variants that are like circulating. Um, will this be, so it's became pretty clear by now that like the first two shots are not enough. So you need like at least one booster to like let, let level that up we don't know if that's going to become now and should become now an annual thing and that because also like most people haven't been vaccinated um four times yet so we we don't have this answer yet um i don't know it's really i think depends on like what variants are circulating certainly has been shown that we asked about masks masks are helping social distancing is helping um vaccinating uh, more than industry nations but vaccinating the entire world is going to be important to like you know as long as we allow like you know every time we allow infection like if there is a there's a possibility of a new variant that can occur so i think it's a moving target and uh, and we will have to wait to like get better you know idea of what what are we doing and, and what is working and what is not Okay, the last question is from Artu uh, Capon. Is there any study showing a strong indication of a, an antibody tighter serum protection level yet? Uh, for, for instance, uh, amount of antibody titers in a IPSO assay correspond to sterilizing immunity on humans? Well, so all of these uh, vaccine studies have been based on antibody titers first. So, and we know that these vaccines early on were able to prov provide infection. So in this case, I would say, um, yes, this was a good indication if like you use a strong immune response zero conversion and it correlated early on with like, you know, um, um, zero pro like protection from it. But, but the important point is like, that is not the whole picture. So there, there is like always like, you not only, you want to have a vaccine that, uh, that protects you from like severe hospitalization and severe disease, which has very different parameters involved than just antibody titers. So I, I think we, what, what we have learned now is that you really need to look at the bigger picture um, to get the full uh, analysis. Also, because we know um, for other systems that there's people that don't have antibodies, but T-cells, they are somewhat protected against influenza, for example. But so I think it's important to look at everything. I don't think there is easy parameters and easy correlations that you can just measure um, when you look at that, because, uh, because then we would already know <laughs> much more for all the other vaccines too. So. Okay, uh, we have Luzia here. Uh, Daniela knows Luzia. Ah! Uh, <laughs> uh, she, uh, Daniela, great daughter. Uh, in the studies of vaccinated, do you assess the possibility of the risk of new infection in these individuals during the evaluations? Any ideas to neutralize the IgA? Yes, so we have the data I've been showing you uh, is donors that have been, uh, by the way, hi Lucia. Lucia was in my lab too once uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> so um, we have been collecting these samples early when like reinfections or breaks or infections were not so common. So, it, so now we have a very different scenario, right? Because now a lot of people are reinfected. A lot of people um, are exposed to multiple, you know, like, you know, different vaccines, different uh, viruses. So we don't know yet. So in our cohort, we have not been following up if any of these have then later on got the breakthrough infection. But we will have some people that have been in our study and we know later on. But that, that is in the works right now has not been uh, studied. So I don't know yet. She just make a correction. Any idea about EJA neutralizing? <laughs> so we have been measuring IGA in natural infection. So not, not no. I don't have any idea about if this can neutralize. So we also didn't see um, an, a big difference between the vaccines in IGA. So that's back to the question was asked about mucosal immunity. So that's going to become relevant there. Yeah. So I don't know yet. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Daniela. Uh, it was a very nice presentation and the, uh, also a very nice debate. Um, I would like to thank you, you and your group, uh, 
for all this research and the, all these uh, outstanding uh, results about T cells, because it, everybody think about the antibody and sometimes they forgot T cells in the protection. And the, I think he, uh, you have uh, showed that the, they are really important the, in the protection uh, for uh, disease, but they also have a, a protection during the uh, avoid the hospitalization. So, and the I don't know. I think we don't have any more questions. And the thank I'd you. I like to thank you for your for inviting. Can I me. can I can I make a question? I was just watching here, and I was waiting <laughs> for people to ask. So can I <laughs> can I ask one? Yes. And so, Daniela, thank you for the presentation. It was very nice. And uh, if I didn't understand uh, wrong, uh, it seems that we are going to take vaccines every six months to get protected against COVID, isn't it? So it seems that uh, there is a, a deadline for the vaccines to, to help preventing the, the, the COVID. Is, is that true? Is, are we going to be dependent on vaccines every six yeah, that's, months uh, that's for that's a exactly long time? That, that's, yes, that's exactly the question that, 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 that is everybody's asking right now. Like, do we need a vaccine every six months? Like, does it do anything to the T cells if you're constantly exposed? We don't know. Um, also, like, what I'm personally very interested in is like, okay, well, why, why are these 10% that cannot mount uh, memory? Like, what's different in these? If we can find these people in the beginning, then maybe they need to get a vaccine every six months, but not everybody. So I think there's a lot of variables, a lot of questions. And, uh, and I think it will be important to address because like, yes, otherwise, we, I mean, right now, everybody has been vaccinated because there was no clear indication of like, you know, who needs to be mostly protected, who, who is like susceptible. So if we find out like what can dictate if you're a responder or not early on, then I think that would be like very valuable. So that's one of my, uh, my questions. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. Yeah. Well, thank all of you. Um, I am impressed by all the questions you're asking. Everything that's on my mind, so I don't. Know. <laughs> this is good. And uh, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, I have been in person at your campus before, and I hope I'll be back in person. So that oh, you're very welcome. Come. <laughs> yeah. And please thank come as soon as possible. So thank so. you, Fernanda, for mediating this this session. I'm going to to. Uh, to ask Marli to, to finish the session and thank you, Danielle, again for being here with us. And Marli, please, I think you can finish. It. Marli Tamuda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Daniela. Excellent presentation and good results. Um, uh, thank you to, for Fernando for indicate, indicating this, this important lecture for us in this moment of the that in pandemic pandemic. Um, uh, na próxima semana a gente vai falar sobre meio ambiente, que aproveitando a, a semana né do, a, as comemorações da semana do meio ambiente. Tá bom? Então, esperamos que todos estejam aqui presentes também para prestigiar esta palestra. Um, it was a, a, a big public uh, watching your presentation, Daniela. Oh, good. Then, thank you. <laughs> very good, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you.